Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Connor Beaton, and he's here to share with us his new book, Men's Work, A Practical Guide to Face Your Darkness, End Self-Sabotage, and Find Freedom. So Connor is the founder of Man Talks, an international organization dedicated to the personal and professional growth of men. He is an entrepreneur, writer, keynote speaker, and facilitator dedicated to building better men. Connor has spoken to large corporate brands, nonprofits, schools, and international organizations such as United Nations, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, Apple, TED Talks, and Entrepreneurs Organization. So welcome to the show, Connor Beaton. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. And what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. What inspired you to write this? Yeah, I mean, I think the the easiest way to describe it is in my my own journey. I'll try and condense it, but I had my own journey. I was, you know, living a a very uh, different life in my past life, traveling the world, et cetera. And all that sort of fall, fell apart and I hit rock bottom and it put me on a very different path about 10, 12 years ago. And uh, a part of that path put me on a, a direction of building an organization that uh, basically helped men be the best versions of themselves, better fathers, husbands, business leaders, um, eh, brothers, etc. And one of the things that I've noticed within the therapeutic industry is that there's not a lot of resources for men. And so I was, as I've worked with men over the past decade, I've had a lot of guys reach out, a lot of therapists, a lot of counselors, psychologists asking for a, a resource that guys could go through to you know, better themselves in their relationship, but also have tactical work that they could actually do to deepen their level of of self awareness and self understanding. So that's that's the long and the short of it. So when we talk about men's work, what specifically is that? Essentially, I mean, men's work is is a broad term that describes a lot of different perspectives. You know, men's work started back in the seventies and eighties with. Uh, people like Robert Bly, who were really at the forefront of something called the mythopoetic men's movement, where they would study myth and mythology as a means of understanding our our psychological narratives and arcs. Men's work today has come to mean many things. I think uh, you know our our slogan within my organization, Man Talks, is it, it's not therapy, it's training. And so, men's work for me is taking psychological principles, principles based on stoicism, um, therapeutic modalities, and merging them into a kind of psychological warrior training or or uh, like a tough mutter for your for your mind and your body and your heart and soul. And so men's work is essentially, I'll condense it down into being able to confront the things in your life that you've been avoiding. That's ultimately what men's work is about. It's being able to move closer towards the things that you haven't wanted to talk about, the things that you haven't wanted to deal with, the things that you haven't wanted to admit about what's happening in your marriage or your sex life or as a parent or at work or in your finances, and then to do the work to move towards your edge in confronting and facing some of those things alongside other men. I think that's really the important part that's not being done in a silo because as we've seen in our modern culture, uh, isolation is really running rampant and it's very much running rampant amongst men, especially the younger generation. Your book's separated into four different categories and you start with leading through darkness. So what is that? Yeah, so uh, a lot of my work is based off of um, Carl Jung, who's a famous uh, Swiss psychoanalyst back in the 20th century, and he came up with a, a concept called the shadow. And so the first part of the book is about leading through darkness in the sense that it is about the individual reader, the the man or the woman, because we've I've had lots of women that have read through it to better understand men. But specifically, it's about the, the the man being able to turn towards the aspects of himself that he hasn't wanted other people to know about. 
So whether that's he's, you know, he's been hiding a, a gambling addiction or he hasn't been able to talk about or admit maybe some childhood abuse or trauma or neglect or abandonment that he experienced, being able to discuss his insecurities. So the beginning of the book is all about turning towards the aspects, the psychological, emotional, physical aspects of ourselves that we don't want other people necessarily to know about. And the reason why that's so important is that these are the things that get in the way of the goals and the aims that we have in our life, right? Carl Jung said that the shadow creates an unconscious snag that aims to thwart our goals and our most well-meaning intentions. And so if we don't deal with our own darkness, especially as men, we then project that darkness out into the world. We bring our, our repressed anger into our relationship. Our insecurities start to show up around the people that we date and that we love and that we want to be with. And they start to sabotage the intimacy and the connection that we're craving. It starts to infiltrate the way that we parent, shows up within our, our work dynamic. And so leading through darkness, the very beginning is really about discovering what does your shadow look like as an individual? What are the things that you've hidden from people that you don't want to admit? What are the things that maybe are in there that are very important? You know, what strengths are actually buried in them? Because part of the reason why doing shadow work is so important and why facing our own darkness is important is that there's actually gold buried in there. And by gold, I mean our strengths, a deeper level of peace, a deeper level of self-acceptance. Uh, our confidence sometimes is actually buried within our own darkness. And so by doing this work, we can begin to reclaim some of the, the attributes, strengths, or values that we have uh, lost along the way, or maybe actually just never developed in the first place. And that could be through what um, men have learned from their fathers and grandfathers and the family dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, a huge part of the the book is looking at, um, at least the the first part of the book is looking at your relationship to your father, specifically because you know in in America uh, alone, one in four kids are going to grow up without a father figure in the household, and so a lot of young men have grown up over the years without any kind of of father figure, and so there's an absence um, that a lot of men have grown up with in terms of male role models. Um, and then you have a lot of young boys that have grown up with, you know, stepfathers who were volatile or fathers who were alcoholics or, you know, dads that were workaholics and were barely ever around, uh, or didn't know how to deal with their own issues. And so a huge part of under self-understanding as a man is being able to look at the kind of masculine hand-me-downs that we've been given by our fathers, by our stepfathers, or just by the male role models that have surrounded us and being able to sort of piece apart what we actually want to take with us and what we need to grow beyond because many men live their lives in opposition to their father or father figure or or in accordance with their father or father figure. So trying to repeat you know, his life or trying to avoid becoming anything like him. And when, when we live like that, there's, we lack a sense of freedom, you know, because we're, we're actually just living in avoidance of trying to become like, become someone. And ultimately what ends up happening is uh, inevitably we end up becoming very much like them. And so that's certainly a, a huge part of it. So how do men identify what it is that they really need to work on what that shadow is? Yeah, I mean in the in the first part of the the book I have a good amount of questions for men to actually dig into because it's going to be different for every guy uh, and I have exercises that I walk them through so that they can actually do tactical work, you know, sort of condensing a few years of of therapy into a book <laughs> for a guy because uh, we we like to do stuff, you know, we want to take action. Um but a good way to begin to look at you know what you need to address and face is either your insecurities or your reactivity so your reactivity right when you get volatile and angry and defensive and or combative or 
uh, you know, you're shutting down in your marriage and your relationship. That reactivity is basically like a big lit up neon sign saying your your shadow's in charge, right? Your darkness is in charge right now. And when we're feeling that reactivity, it's often because we have a, a a protection mechanism, right? We're trying to protect ourselves from something, from being vulnerable, from being perceived as weak, et cetera. And so if a man wants to get a very quick understanding of his shadow or of his own darkness, all he needs to do is ask himself, where do I feel insecure? And secondly, what are the things or who are the people that make me reactive? And what does that reactivity actually say about me? And so we begin to turn the lens away from the other person and what they did and what they said and you know how we thought we were right. And we, be, we begin to move the lens of, of awareness and consciousness back in on ourselves and say, what is actually coming up within me? You know, behind that reactivity, am I embarrassed? Do I feel ashamed? Uh, am I sad? Do I feel lonely? Is there some grief that, that's come up in this moment? And so we begin to actually connect to the, the deeper truth of our internal emotional experience. And this is actually what the Stoics were talking about, right? There's a very big misconception within our modern culture that Stoicism is about emotional disconnection when Stoicism is actually a, a process of emotional domestication or taming. And in order to do that, we actually have to build a much more robust relationship with our emotions. We, we need to understand what we're experiencing in order to begin to work with it, right? Because if you just imagine that your, your emotions are different animals, right? In order to know how to work with those animals, you have to get closer to them. You can't treat them all like horses. You know, if you're trying to deal with a tiger and you're trying to deal with a sloth and you're trying to deal with, uh, I don't know, a lemur or a badger uh, and a horse and a cow, how you actually interact with each of those animals is going to be wildly different. And our emotional landscape is very similar, right? How you deal with sadness versus anxiety versus anger it might be a little bit different and your relationship to those emotions are going to be radically different. And so for most men, they need to use the access point of anger as a doorway into their emotional body to begin to understand how do I relate to my own reactivity, my own anger? Is it something that I use all the time as a protective shield or is it something that I'm just terrified of and don't want to go near? And that will that'll just give that individual some indication uh, of their own shadow. And there's a bunch of other stuff, but I think that's that's probably a good beginning. So when we look at the shadow of the mother, what does that look like? Yeah. So <laughs> in the book, I talk about the shadow of the father, and um, you know how it's neither good or bad. It it just it is, and that we need to be able to understand the 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 pain or the hardship that we experienced either trying to become like our fathers or live up to their expectations or um or you know our quest to be nothing like them and the shadow of our mother is a little bit different in the sense that for a lot of young men where their sense of nurturing and where their sense of how they relate to women will will be sort of baked into their primary relationship, uh, their primary feminine female relationship with their mother. And so a man's mother can really create the blueprint for how he interacts with women for not for the rest of his life, but for a, a good amount of time. So the shadow of the mother can be, um, I, I guess to just try and simplify this, the shadow of the mother is often when a man is hypercritical of women, he's afraid of women, uh, he's constantly trying to control women. All of those are examples of a man who has a, a shadow with the mother where he doesn't fully trust women. He's sort of always waiting for a woman to betray him or act in a way that is criticizing of him or contemptuous towards him or or maybe is is constantly expecting women to act in ways that uh, he doesn't understand and has a tremendous amount of judgment towards. 
And so those are just some examples, you know, how that normally shows up is in his, his critique of women and how he relates to them. Uh, Jung said that a woman always stands at the very edge of what a man knows about himself. A woman always stands at the edge of where a man's shadow begins. And so for a lot of guys, women are sort of mysterious creatures and for a, for many men, what we'll do is we'll project our shadow onto women um, because we've you know experienced what we've experienced growing up with our mothers. And so what will happen is that we'll actually, our insecurities, our fears, our worries, our inferiorities, all of those things can, not always, but can often get projected onto the women that we're with. Maybe I'll pause there because I kind of got into some other stuff there. I appreciate you taking the time to explain that because I think it's good when we look at both sides of how our parents really affect, especially our our young men and men in general, just how how they mold and shape thoughts, beliefs, perspectives, all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, oftentimes young boys are looking to their mothers for reinforcement, you know, nurturing, praise, adoration, kind of getting a sense that they're moving in the right direction. While again, a lot of the research, and obviously I'm talking about a sort of more traditional heterosexual relationship, but oftentimes what the research is showing is that young young boys from their fathers are looking for a different subset of, of values or traits or interactions, right? Rough and tumble play, encouraging them to take risks and uh, you know i have a two-year-old son and i see that in him all the time when he wants nurturing and care and we haven't we haven't done anything to uh promote this right like my wife and i haven't done anything to force this on him but when he's looking for nurturing and care ever since he was a little one he's just gone to my wife and that's not because i don't want to nurture and care for him right i'm very happy to hug him and hold him and and kiss him and give him all the love that he wants but for whatever reason, he just goes towards her. And when he wants to take risks or push his boundaries and, and act out, he te- he tests them with me, physically he tests himself with me. And so I do think that uh, oftentimes kids, you know, we as children uh, have different relationships with our, our mothers and fathers, and we expect different things from them and they play different roles. And so later on in life, in our adult relationships, how that attachment will play out will will just look differently, right? And so um, you might see a guy who has very few male friends as an example, and this is very common in our culture today. He has very few male friends because he sort of distrusts the masculine or he distrusts men or he sees other men as maybe a threat. And you know, oftentimes that's rooted in him growing up with a father figure who maybe abandoned him or abused him or neglected him or was just brutally critical. And so, but his mom was kind and caring and nurturing. And so he has, you know, a lot of guys grow up with this sort of uh, lots of female energy around them and not really wanting to surround themselves with a lot of male or masculine energy because it can seem as a threat. So that's just another example. Earlier, you talked about anger. So what can our anger teach us about where we are in our path? Yeah, I mean, anger is and can be a very beautiful uh, teacher in many ways. And, you know, it can can point to what matters to us. Um, There's a wonderful poet named David White, and he said that anger is the deepest form of compassion for another, for the world, for the self for a life, for the body, for a family, and for all of our ideals. And so, you know, anger is often the energy of protection. And it's really in our modern culture, I think that anger has become demonized. And it's been lumped in with things like aggression and violence, and especially when it comes to men. So a lot of men, you know, hear the modern narrative and the the uh, you know sort of stories and narratives about men and about masculinity and what they take from that often is i should disconnect from my anger but the reality is is that in order to have let's just say healthy boundaries in your life you have to feel connected with your anger to some degree you have to be able to understand that when you feel 
angry, maybe sometimes it's because a boundary has been crossed and that that's okay. And it's not about uh, directing the anger at the person. It's actually about allowing the anger and that energy to reinforce a boundary of something that's that's not okay in your life. Um, so anger can teach us a tremendous amount uh, about who we are, about what we want, about what we will tolerate and won't tolerate. Um, anger can also teach us a tremendous amount about what we wish to protect and what actually matters most to us. And so if we disconnect from our anger, we lose out on the ability to stand up for what we think matters to us. We also lose the ability to use our own voice in a way that can be effective by setting boundaries or um, you know, letting other people know what's what's okay and what's not okay with us. And anger can also teach us where we're carrying a deep form of pain. Uh, oftentimes, you know, people who are very aggressive or, or, you know, violent as an example, those individuals are people who have been on the other end of that, right? They've been on the other end of being abused, of, of receiving somebody's hyper aggression or being on the receiving end of somebody's you know, violent expression of shame or sadness or et cetera. And so anger can teach us a lot about who we are, what we want, what we desire, what we wish to protect, and, and even can enter into the territory of helping us better understand what we want to provide in life for the people around us and for ourselves. In your experience, where do men tend to get hung up as they go through this practice? Oh, that one's super simple. It's just in their head. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we are, uh, I've been working with men for over a decade now, and I've worked with tens of thousands of guys all over the world. And where we often get just stuck is in our rational mind. We have been sold uh, a bill of goods that kind of says that our rational mind is the solver of everything. And Einstein had this great quote where he said, the rational mind is a faithful servant and the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. And we've created a culture that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. And so many men have actually just forgotten the gift of their, of their gut, of their intuitive process, of their deeper level of knowing. And it's the thing that, they're, that, we, that we're all sort of searching for is a return to a deeper kind of knowing, a deeper form of wisdom. And so where a lot of guys get stuck when they enter into any kind of psychological or therapeutic modality, depending on what they are needing and depending on the modality, where they can get very stuck is in just talking about their issues and rationalizing their issues. And that largely is not helpful. It's why you know, there's a big push that a lot of people have of you know men should be going to therapy more and men need to go to, yeah, men just need to go to therapy more. But for a lot of guys, you know, when they look at the therapeutic field, it's, it's predominantly uh, women, right? So there's 29% of therapists are men. So it's, it's only a, a very small percentage of therapists or psychologists that are actually men. And so for a lot of guys, when they look at the therapeutic field, the first hesitation is, well, I don't know if I'm going to be very fully understood and the second barrier that they uh, that they can get stuck on is they can go into talk therapy and and not that they'll never get out, <laughs> but they can go into talk therapy and spend years or months in their head, in their rational brain. And so a big part of my work is about getting out of your head, getting out of your rational mind, getting out of the overthinking and the over-rationalizing that so many men are stuck in when they're trying to make a decision of, do I ask her out or do I end this relationship? Should I quit my job? All of these big, important moments in life where men almost always get stuck is that they will ruminate on that problem, on that obstacle, on that challenge for days, weeks, months, and sometimes even years when what they actually need is to move out into their direct experience, into what they're actually experiencing around it. Because that that information, right, that data and your emotions are just a different subset of data can be incredibly helpful for helping 
an individual to understand what decision they should be making. So yeah, <laughs> it's their mind. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time to go through that with us. What do you want our listeners to take away from your book? Yeah, I think that's going to be very dependent on the individual. Um, I just sincerely and genuinely hope that what they get is a deeper form of awareness uh, about who they are and about what they want and what they desire and how to achieve it and accomplish it and to go after it and how the obstacles that they're facing might be the exact thing that they need. Uh, so I hope that that's what the area takes. Honor, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your show as well? Yeah, probably the easiest way is uh, my website is mantalks.com. I have a podcast um, that's a top 100 podcast in America and Canada that's called The Man Talks Show. It's just M-A-N-T-A-L-K-S, like man and talks. Uh, and then probably the best place to go is Instagram. I'm pretty active on there. And again, it's just at man talks on there. Well, Connor, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you, Connor. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Men's Work, a practical guide to face your darkness, end self-sabotage and find freedom. Men's Work is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and every place books are sold. And if you don't see it on the shelf, just ask for them to order it. And remember, support our indie bookstores. Again, if you'd like to connect with Connor, you can at his website, connorbeaton.com, for more information. Well, we're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after this message. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.